uh, good afternoon. Well, it's a pleasure to be in Vienna again after these difficult years. Um, it's my second conference without a mask. <laughs> so I'm very happy now. I appreciate how nice it is and especially the invitation coming from students. Um, I couldn't say no to that. So, so thank you very much. And I hope that um, what, what I'm going to explain is going to be of interest. Of course, what I'm going to say is mainly the result of, well, about 20 years of research in southern Iberia of a whole team from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. I have put on the slide the professors, my colleagues at the Institute of Prehistory of La Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. And um, so let's start. The, the lecture will be uh, structured in four chapters. How do I change By, with the mouse? Or? Um, yeah, with the mouse. Ah, with the mouse. Just uh, okay, okay, because each one is a different world. Okay, well, I will, I will, we will, I will want to start with a very general picture, which is the big questions we are dealing at the moment concerning the third and second millennium. What what is the big panorama, which is basically a panorama which has changed dramatically since we have genetic data. Because suddenly we know that the third millennium was a big period of contact, of migration, but also of integration. And the second part will be more theoretical, and there I want to talk about how we define the state, which is important, because if we say there is a state, it depends on how you define it, you know. So, like Wittgenstein here in Vienna said, it all depends on how you define things. Of course, if you define a stone and you then would say, oh, look, there is a stone. So, obviously, because it's out logical. And then I will speak mainly about the Largar. And if we have time, the, the fourth part, I will talk a little bit about what it means, what we call disruptive economies. And maybe I can show some things on Aunetids, which we are doing now uh, together with the uh, Museum and Landesdenkmalamt of Sachsen-Anhalt, which uh, is very interesting in comparison to a Largar. And maybe you also here have something similar. Okay, so let's start. We start, how is the world structures uh, around the middle of the third millennium? Um, we called this in a conference, in an international conference in Halle, the old world. Uh, why? Because it is a world which is deeply interconnected. We have in the, in, in the, Uh, we have on the one hand in Africa and in, um, in Egypt, Africa, of course, and Mesopotamia, we have the first empires, we have the first definite state with centralized economies, writing, um, monarchies, um, um, clearly centralized temples, religions. But then we also have the whole world of Anatolia and Aegean, which could be defined by the Depas Amphicupelon. Um, if you are in Cyprus, some of you, well, that, that will be interesting, of course. Um, and it's a world which is interconnected uh, very strongly. Uh, then, of course, we have in north of the Black Sea, we have the Yamnaya complex, which has become very fashionable to talk about since we have DNA. And north of it, we have the coded work culture uh, and west we have the whole bell beaker culture and these are entities which clearly are in connection which have common rituals which have common funerary rites and co apparently common drinking practices or food consumption practices um, and as I say, it, uh, the DNA data shows us that we have these connections from East Europe towards West Europe in a very short time between 2800. And as our recent paper showed in El Argar, we know now that in El Argar started around 2200 at the time when the first population with a step component was appearing in Southeast Iberia. That doesn't mean that the El Argar people are Yamnaya or, 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 or steppe people, but it means that that migration in the end over 600 years even reached the most southwestern parts of Europe over generation. And that 
when it arrives, it's still 20% of the genome. You know? So the ancestry is clearly very linked uh, to this phenomenon of migration. And also we know that El Agar at 2200 has a Mediterranean component which uh, can be from uh, Sicily, can be from Central, but can also be from the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, if you look at the paper in Science, we could not model statistically Elargar without an Eastern Mediterranean Iranian component. It doesn't work statistically. You're missing about 10% of the population DNA. So we need this Eastern Mediterranean element to model this. Um, and, uh, for example, we also know Thomas Schumacher's works on ivory uh, from the German Archaeological Institute that there is Asian ivory arriving in southern Iberia in the third millennium. So it's not, it's, it's clearly, we don't know how it reached there. We suppose by sea, but we don't have the ships. We don't know anything about the ivory of Crete, for example, or of Sicily, where it comes from, but probably all these islands were linked somehow. Surprisingly, and this is one big debate, this world collapses totally, vanishes around 2200. In Iberia, Los Millares, Villanova de Sao Pedro, San Bujal, all these settlements are destroyed or abandoned, burned down between more or less 2300, 2200. But also in Central Europe, the Bell Beaker culture, for example, here, or the Ported Ware culture disappears approximately about 2200 years. In 2015, we thought maybe it's climate. Um, it wasn't convincing. Some area seems to be, you know, the famous 4.2K event, which is something especially in Mesopotamia was observed. In Mesopotamia, the Akkadian, the end of the Akkadian Empire has been uh, linked by, by Professor Weiss to this event, a climatic event, which must have been some years of dramatic drought. But in other areas, we don't see it. For example, in Anatolia, you don't see this event. So climate isn't uniform everywhere. Uh, then it was um, uh, different uh, ideas were, could it be plague? We now know that in the third millennium, we have the first wave of plague. And that comes from Eastern Europe. And so from the steppe region, so maybe these populations which are coming from the steppe are at the same time coming as this plague. And this has been a debate now also since 2015, which could well be possible that something is, a, and maybe it's a double thing. It's something which is, you know, having feedback between climate and, and, and plague. And these are the open questions at the moment we are debating all over Europe and, and Eurasia, um, because we don't have a definite answer. But the clear thing is that after 2200, a whole new world appears, a whole different map appears. And it's a map of isolation, regionalization, maybe not isolation, but the, uh, is the wrong word, but regionalization. We see suddenly emerging both in the Middle East and Near East, in the Aegean, Central Europe, Western Europe, we see small power entities. In the Aegean, of course, it's the Middle Helladic and Early, uh, and, uh, early Late Helladic one. Um, we have the Ottomani, um, Fritze Saboni uh, groups in, 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 in the Carpathian Basin. We have the Aunetids all over Central Europe, we have the Wessex, we have the Armorican, and we have Elarga. And only in these regions. And the rest of Europe is relatively poor in spectacular finds. In these regions, we have princely graves, we have individual graves with weapons. And these are outstanding graves, which are only in this area. And until very recently, we thought these are independent developments. And maybe now, because of DNA, this paradigm is changing. And now we are talking, maybe this is a political, these are political and economic systems, which are not comparable to the Near East, to Egypt, but which have something in common, and which is something which maybe made them into a state or proto-state societies. And this is the historical question. What happened at that time what happened? Why do we have this enormous change? And why are these similarities existing? 
How did we interpret this? And here we come into the interpretative part. In Central Europe, like here, we called them, they were called the princely grave, the Fürstengräber. Yeah? Here we have an image of Leubingen, which is dated by Dendro, Dendro dated to um, 1942. And the, it's a central grave. It was excavated in the 19th century. There is not still, uh, thanks to the diaries, uh, we know a lot about, about this, this burial. It is in all the handbooks. And if you, and this is the grave goods, you see halberds, you see something which Sven Hansen would call uh, the Überausstattung. Uh, you see the chisels, the axes, and the golden arm ring, the golden locking ring, the, the heirlooms, and the needles. And also very important uh, at the lower left side, the anvil. The anvil, which shows metal working, is important in this world, which we have many bell beaker burials also with anvils. So it's something uh, clearly which shows that mm, power is related to met met metallurgy in this moment. How did how is this individual burial interpreted? Well, if you look, for example, at the Atlas der Vorgeschichte of 2009, you will find this uh, drawing and you see there is an eminent figure who is watching how they are building his uh, his tomb or his father's tomb. Um, and uh, who is this person? Of course, what we did so far until very, this is what I was shown when, and, and uh, Alexandra, when we were students, you were shown service and, and, and freed and the classical anthropological evolutive uh, development of, of, of power. You start in very simple way of bands and then you get tribes and then you get chiefdoms and finally you get the state. And the only thing we had to do in prehistory is just say, where are we? So evidently this guy, uh, very powerful, he is the first, he's not the state, he is the first because we only have his burial and he is a, a chief, so he's a, a chieftain. We didn't know anything about the settlements. We only had, to, we were only excavating and publishing tombs. And this has totally changed, as we know, also thanks to different excavations all over Europe, thanks to settlement archeology span after the seventies. But what do we call a state? The main thing is that um, we have to understand that society needs each other. We produce socially. We are, cannot live as individuals. All production, as Marx said in the Grundrisse, is a social production. There is no individual production because we cannot consume all what we are producing and we are, cannot produce all what we are consuming. We need. The economy is the basic definition of why we are social entities, probably why we are talking, why we have a language, because we need to cooperate. Cooperative uh, practices are the essence, not only of humans, but particularly of humans. What happens? <clears throat> Social production, we all together, we produce wealth, economic material and immaterial wealth, and we produce a surplus. We do not only produce things just to live and just to survive. We will always try to produce a little bit more, because maybe there is a crisis, maybe there is a bad year, maybe we want to make a party, maybe we want to invite, maybe somebody is coming from outside, like now, you know, the immigration, migrants can always be coming. So better to have, you know, in the cupboards a little bit more of food than you really need to. The thing is that when this starts to be accumulated, how do you assign them? To who is this? this production, this wealth being distributed. And the main thing, of course, is that the subsistence goods are channeled into a secondary production, crafts, services, taking care. Today, I got stuck in the manifestation of Vienna uh, because of care, of course, because we need to care of old people, we need to care of young people. So all these working, working people say we need a decent salary. That is, these Sovietons, how to who do we give this surplus? To who do we give this uh, uh, wealth? Do we consider homework as a productive job, which mainly women still are doing or not? How are we going to evaluate this? These are important questions in a society. And the problem is that if there is a social class on top 
of this circulation, which defines what is the value and how much a caring person or a bus driver or a, a farmer will receive for his work, then we have a dominant class. And the main element from a Marxist point of view is that you have a dominant class which perpetuates its rights and its wealth through coercive activities. And in that moment, politics, which should be about sharing and about cooperation, how much do we work to do what for consuming how many people, suddenly gets a power, a right of the dominant class. We can, I also pass today the Börse of Vienna and you could steal this surplus in the birth. And this is, when this becomes fixed in time and space, borders, inheritance, that is the economic, the political economy of states. At the same time, this is not sufficient to define a state because the state, as I said, needs a coercive mm, uh, mechanisms. And there is physical coercion, but as important as physical coercion is psychical coercion. So a state needs armies, weapons, jails, taxes. And the, physical, the psychical, of course, is symbols, icons, languages, ceremonies. While the one, the physical side, looks for oppression of people, you cannot build a state only with oppression. For example, many things in the recent where you can see a state needs obedience. Hannah Arendt said this, violence is not sufficient for a state. States, in fact, try to be little violent or specifically violent, very targeted. What states need is obedience. And how they do this is a mechanism of obedience of physical and psychical coercion. I'm going to show in Elargar, what can we find in Elargar from all this? What can we say is there uh, present of these concepts? Can we link the archaeological material to any of these concepts? This is what I'm going to try to show now. Because only then we can say that in our definition of historical materialism, Elargar is or is not a state. Okay. So let's start. 2200, Los Millares, the large six hectare, large copper age settlement, is abandoned by fire, is destroyed around 2300, 2250. And a new entity starts. A new entity starts in an area about 4,000 square kilometers. The Akkadian Empire and the Sargon started with about 4,000 square kilometers. Things start very small, smaller than we expect. I was surprised when I found this with, with the Akkadian Empire. I said, well, not so bad for Elanga. And you can see it's the area southeast Iberia and the um, the rainfall map in the in the top shows you that it, the southeast Iberia is the most arid area today of all of Iberian Peninsula. So it's really strange. It's something we do not understand. Why El Argar did not emerge in the Guadalquivir? The Guadalquivir, you know, is Tartessos, is where the Phoenicians, when they exploited the silver there, we have the, the, uh, the, the, the Iron Age, mainly is, 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 is in the, in the, also the Neolithic in the Guadalquivir. The Guadalquivir is the most wealthiest because the land is so fertile. But no, in El Argar starts in Southeast Iberia as a very strange uh, entity if we look at Europe, because it's organized around hilltop settlements. Here we have Fuente Alamo. Uh, hilltop settlements are the main political and economic element of this entity. And what is surprising, and which reminds us of, of Eastern Mediterranean, is that the burials in El Argar are placed inside the settlements. It's an intramural burial rite as we have in the Eastern Mediterranean, which already Schubert said, maybe this is an indication of elements from Eastern Mediterranean, which we now can confirm through genetic analysis of some of these burials. 
there is an Eastern Mediterranean co uh, component. But all this has changed when we started excavating 2009 and La Bastida. Here you have a view how to get to La Bastida. It's extremely complicated. You have to uh, cross the gorge from the, from the lowlands. And you can see in the middle of this image, La Bastida, very well protected by some mountains which are up to 1,000 meters high. Uh, its western side is totally inaccessible. It's vertical cliffs and the whole side is 300 meters long. Uh, here you see it when you come from the south, uh, the most accessible part. This is the side of uh, about five hectares which was occupied by a community arriving as the 14 day show us around 2200. And this is this population, which is a mixture of people coming from central Spain with a step component, and it's people coming from Eastern Mediterranean. Something occurred that these people united and said, we are going to put a city on this hill. And this city had never been inhabited before and was never inhabited uh, later, which is a fantastic thing for archaeology, for prehistoric archaeology, but which opens the question, why did they go to this place? Because there is nothing special here. This is the excavations in the 1940s, how it looked in before the excavation, just after the Civil War. Um, this is how it looked when we, when we came in 2008, and you can see over the years, how the excavations continued. Now you see the fortification line, which was discovered in 2012 uh, on the image in the lower right side. Uh, massive construction. Here we have another aerial view with these towers, which are preserved up to four meters in height. Uh, truly exceptional. Uh, the tumble shows us that this wall was about six, seven meters in height. Um, and no such, it's solid towers. It's a solid wall about two meters wide, one to two meters wide. We have nothing like this in the Iberian uh, Peninsula before. If you try to find parallels for this, you again look at Troy, at Egina Colonna in the Aegean, or at the first cities in, is in Palestina. It is uh, polyorcetic engineering which may be local, but if you look for, uh, for example, for, for parallels, they are found again in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so it's surprising, why are they, and the oldest C14 dates of La Bastida are the wall. They come, colonize the hill, and the first thing they do is to build a wall, a protection wall. So they are protecting themselves from something. They are coming from a conflict. There is something happening. And I mean, just imagine the workforce necessary to build this. The wall was probably about 300 plus meters long, six to, to seven meters high. Um, it's a massive construction built in a few decades, probably. Um, so this founding act, um, if we here we have uh, the, the 3D reconstruction done by Dani Mendez, um, here it would be a look from the other side of the, of, of, of the river uh, or the stream, looking upwards. As you see, mud brick was an important part. The wall had painting. And we have one in, at that time, at that beginning of El Argar, there are many um, small huts in the settlement, but we have one central building, which as you see also has a height still of three meters high with huge post holes in the middle, silos, storage rooms. And what we see apart from silos, we found copper ingots in that building. And we found ivory, probably North African ivory, no burials, no fireplace, it didn't seem to be a house. It seemed to be a super domestic entity. So our drafts uh, uh, man, he draw this with this interpretation. As you see the women having a special role because their tombs, as you will see, are special. Uh, so maybe a center of redistribution of economic surplus. 
Anyway, architectonically, it's strange building at that time. And in terms of, of storage capacity, it's unique in the whole settlement as far as we excavated, which is about 10% of the site. But then after 2000, El Argar grows exponentially over the whole of Southeast Iberia from these 4,000 square kilometers in the beginning to 35,000 square kilometers in the end. About the highest expansion is about 1650 BC. That would be, if, I don't know how familiar you are with Aegean uh, uh, chronology, that would be the shaft graves Schliemann excavated uh, in, 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 in uh, Mycenae, for example. Yeah? Um, and also ring B would be a little bit earlier. So that would be the Mycenae. The beginning of the Mycenaean is the maximum expansion of El, El Arga. How did they expand? The political entity, as I already said, is these hilltop fortifies. The whole territory of El Argar is you have one of these hilltop settlements every 20, 30 kilometers. And they are about from one to five hectares large, usually larger than one hectare. We have none which is 10 hectares. So the largest is La Bastida and Lorca, which is around five and six hectares. And as you can see in the photographs, they're always terribly well protected. But the other element we have is that this expansion, we have the warrior graves. And these are tombs. And that is, again, something which reminds of our Aunitids, male burials. Uh, here we see the excavation of uh, burial 60 in, in, in La Bastida. And you can see the halberd and the dagger. They always are burials with halberd and dagger, plus uh, fauna offerings, plus pottery. But the main element is always halberd and dagger, so a double combined a military uh, um, armor, armory. Uh, and people said, oh, this is prestige. No, we looked at the use wear of the halberds and all have use wear traces. And we have the impact, for example, in this case, the skull, he must have had some type of leather helmet or something, but clearly these are impacts which could very well come from a pointed weapon like a halberd. Um, and here you see another, the, how it was excavated. This is a huge burial in Lal Moloya. It's the largest burial at that phase. Here you see the excavation here, and you can see how the dagger, he's wearing the dagger at his humerus, and the halberd is just lying next to it. When we, this is published uh, some years ago, when you look where these burials are, 90% of them are in the homeland, El Argar homeland, where El Argar started to develop in these 4,000 kilometers of the beginning. Very few harbors you have in the remaining of El Argar territory. So there was something distinct of the homeland and they were buried in this homeland, while it didn't appear to ha happen in the rest of the area where there are burials. There are El Argar burials, but not with or hardly with harbors, only 10%. So there is a territorial, what I want to say is that this idea that power needs a territory is clearly emphasized, not only in the distribution of hilltop settlements, but also of the weapons. But when we look at another element, uh, we did a um, distribution of metal uh, based on Dirk Brandherm's work on the daggers of the Iberian Peninsula. So we just looked how many daggers, it's a, it's a density map, an exponential density map of how much metal daggers you have in different parts of the Iberian Peninsula. And as you see, El Argar has exponentially more metal than all the rest of the Iberian. And it is like isolines, it decreases the more you get away. So. The, we are now presenting, which will be published next, next week uh, or next month, a uh, paper of talking about core periphery relationships. Probably El Argar was a strong core of economic and political strength and had a huge periphery around it, which in a certain way we still have to find out how far it was exploited, how, what was coming uh, from this periphery to El Argar. And, 
of course, one thing could be cereal, you know, could be cereal surplus, uh, cash crops. Um, you also see the swords which are appearing. The sword appears around 1750, and most of the swords uh, are in Southeast Iberia. But the swords found in the rest of the Iberian, they are all of Elargar type. So that suggests maybe they are gifts, but they could even be razzias, evidence of razzias outside of El Algar to get the surplus or to let labor force, slaves, servants. All these are things, ideas we have to be open and we have to think about them and not discard them, you know, as we have done so far. But how do you define, apart from hilltops and halberts, how do you define El Algar? In a very strict ritual rite, where male and female are buried in different positions with different grave goods, but also where the aristocracy, the middle class and the exploited class is buried in different ways. And age is also, we can nearly know a boy or a girl from the high class, if she dies uh, before six years, she will just get a golden earring. While if she dies after 14 years, she will get a dagger, a knife and, a, and, and an owl. So it's really a highly uh, standardized way over 600 years to bury their people. But more fascinating maybe than the burial rite is the pottery. If you go to the Museum of Granada, or you go to the Museum of Jaén, or you go to the other side, to Alicante or to Murcia or Almeria, you will always find these pots. One of them standing in Professor Kenlib's uh, office. And uh, reproduction, well said. <laughs> um, so now we are doing thin sections on this pottery, not only on this shape, but on all of them. And we see that the clay is all the same clay they are doing for 600 years. The same six pottery shapes, this is only one, sorry, seven pottery shapes in 600 years, never decorated and always with the same clay. So you think that can only be a centralized production. This, and here we have the concept of symbolical standardization of uh, Ramonet said, you, the sociologist, unified thinking. If you only see Coca-Cola bottles, you think that the world is made by Coca-Cola. If you only see this pottery, there's no decoration there's n for 600 years. This is the symbolic universe you are surrounding since you are a kid. There's no other way of thinking. So it's a mono uh, homogenization of thinking politically, ideologically, symbolically, but it is clearly an attempt to uniformize thought. And that is what fascism does. So um, social categories, as I said, the grave goods uh, study undertaken took, took by, by Vicente Luy and Jordi Esteves showed we have three classes. We have three clear classes based on five funerary combinations. The aristocracy, the richest graves are 10%. The middle class, women and male, are 50%, and the graves with hardly any grave good, or just a part, are about 40%. This is about what we think was in rough numbers, at least in the core area, the social stratification. And this was perpetuated over time and time again and again. And again. Let's go into one excuse, let's go into one settlement of this, which is Fuente Alamo, which was excavated by the German Archaeological Institute. Uh, here we have Hermann Ulreich in front of us, who was one of the excavators together with uh, Hermann Fritz Schubert and Volker Pingel and Oswaldo Arteaga. And you see it's again a protected hilltop settlement. More or less 7% of the site, 8% was excavated. And you can see already in the top, on the summit of the, of the hill, you can see the most monumental buildings, square towers, uh, a water system, a large water system uh, in the lower left side of the ground plan, and the reconstruction, which was proposed by Volker Pingel, a multi-story, 
as we saw in La Bastida. This is later. This is not, this is about 2000, um, uh, sorry, 1800. The building La Bastida was 2200. So this is a little bit later, uh, more monumental even, very, uh, the walls are two meters thick. And probably this were storage rooms because in the, around them and in them, dozens of grinding stones were found. So we think they were obviously also some political meeting point, but if you have several stories, they probably combined accumulation of surplus and political decision-making on that surplus. Um, because in this settlement, we excavated and we dug up so far, we have 2,500 grinding stones, 2,500. This is just a small sample. In 10%, in 8% of the settlement, if the whole, imagine the dimension, the calculations we made shows that with this amount of grinding tools, they could have fed 2000 persons easily with flour. The botanical record shows that it is barley, that it is barley, and it was stored in these huge storage jars which are found in some parts of the hill again, of the hill settlement. So clearly these were cereal banks. We see them as cereal banks for barley. Barley is a dry land agriculture. They are bringing this, this, this cereal and they are storing that and transforming it. So it's a mill, a bank, a cereal bank and a mill for a huge territory capable of feeding 2,000 persons, which are impossible to house in that settlement. The settlement is just 200 hectares. That can be 500 people living there, but never. So it's impossible to, to, to have 2,000 people there, but they are able to feed 2,000 people. And these people lived in the lowlands. So here, if you look at the workshops, the southern slope of the hill has these workshops. In some of these workshops, uh, uh, we found 12 grinding stones simultaneously used. Here you have one installation on the left side. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, so in La Bastida, was it different? Uh, the PhD thesis of Mireille Hache has also shown it's very similar. So hundreds of grinding stones in the area excavated. Uh, not only of storage, no, there are not only evidence of storage of grain, but also of water, as you see in this system, uh, restored. This is the reconstruction. You could uh, accumulate about nearly 400,000 cubic meters of water, which would be enough to, to maintain a population of 1,000 persons, which we think La Bastida had. La Bastida was five hectares, Puente Alamo was only two hectares large. Um, so it's public investment, it's public uh, uh, architecture, as in Fuente Alamo, but on an even larger scale. And here you have the, the houses, you can see the cistern, you can see the ground plants. It's, you know, like a North African Kasbah uh, with very narrow streets. You don't see what happens. If you go to a Copper Age settlement like Los Millares, it's small huts with lots of open spaces, you can see what happens here. From outside, you don't see what is going on. You can hide surplus, you can hide people. Um, you don't show what you're doing and, and only we know. And what we find in this house, in, in, in building number 18, is again 17 uh, grinding stones simultaneously being used and again, we like to, you know, for the general public to show how it could be based on what we find archaeologically. So these are some sketches in the end. This, we, we presented it in this. Again, a woman is leading this redistribution because in this building, the only middle class burial is a female burial and all the other burials are poor. So this is why we put a woman leading this workshop of cereal production, of cereal processing. Uh, and this, of course, reminds us of the models we have from Egypt, where we know how these state mills are working, and which, of course, also for Mesopotamia, like Ebla, are described in, in, in cuneiform texts. 
so, I mean, 12 people working together, you will not find that anywhere in the world in domestic context, as our, for example, ethno-archaeological work in Western Africa has shown, or as other work in Guatemala has shown. Normally, you have only one or two grinding stones per household, which fits the number of women who are grinding, because unfortunately, grinding since the Neolithic is a burden of the women, unfortunately. Um, and, and here we have much larger installation. Men probably were grinding. And that opens the question, could they be slaves? And if they are slaves, where are these slaves coming from? Where are they getting them from? And then you come to the idea, can the periphery be an important thing? But we also have like a, a building number three here in Restored, how you couldn't visit it today. Uh, it was a granary. There's not one a grinding stone. It's only uh, uh, pithos, large pottery jars, full with cereal, full with um, uh, barley. barley and less barley. The botanical record is 95% barley, barley, barley. It's a barley bank, you know, and um, it is it is banked in this. Here, uh, again, a reconstruction, how we could imagine how this works. But then time, I mean, we are talking Elargar is 600 years. It will not be the same in the beginning as in the end. And here, this is from Mireya Aches, PhD, over time, the amount of grinding stones. And as you see, it starts at 2,200 with very few grinding stones. This could be domestic. Then it gets more, more, but especially after 1,750 or 1,775, it triples, doubles or triples. And in Fuentanamo, it's exactly the same. So there is a huge increase in means of production in tools, but also in labor force, because otherwise, why do you have the tools if you're not using them? And which phase is this? The phase of the maximum expansion. This is the phase when El Argar was controlling the whole of Southeast uh, uh, Iberia and even part of Central Iberia. So again, an indication something has happened and we are in an exponential economic growth of surplus production. But look at the topography, you are hidden. It's not a Roman villa, yeah? It's, it's a place hidden. These mills are hidden in the landscape, in the, in, the, in the area. So the reconstruction we do is that there is a peasant population in the valley and they are, taking, they are bringing up the, the surplus, not only cereal, of course, but at least that is what we see archaeological most easily because of the grinding stones. So the key, the key question is what was going on in the lowland? What was happening in the fertile lowlands? So um, my colleagues and I, we started to excavate a small settlement in the lowlands to see maybe we here we have a, 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 um, something related to this exploited uh, uh, peasantry. Well, far from that, what we found was something even more incredible. Here you see, this is the site, it's called La Tira del Lienzo. Um, here we are flying some air photographs. And as you see in the center, there's a hundred square meter building, a square building surrounded <coughs> by cells, you know, like it looks like a, um, a storage area. And in fact, we found a granary in one of these, um, of these rooms. But the main interest, of course, was the central building. What did we find in the central building? Here, a view, a reconstructed view, how you could, would see it from the lowlands. The peasants would see it this way. This would be from the air, uh, how the birds would see it. And here we have, and what did we find? We found large grinding stones, but mainly we found um, five, uh, five tools made out of gabbro, and they were analyzed here in Vienna. We brought them here and then we were analyzed by, by uh, Mehofer. And what he found, what he found today uh, to, together with, with Katya is silver traces, silver traces. So they are anvils as in the burial of Leubingen, but for the first time, not in a burial, but in a context. And they are not for copper working, but they are for silver working. So in this building, Somebody was a silversmith, smithing, forging silver objects. 
And the chemical analysis fit perfectly what is uh, silver of El Agar. It's, it's nothing. And again, we know how these workshops were working in Egypt, just you know, as, a, as a general reference, how we can imagine these workshops. Um, and besides, the main silver object is the diadem. And the size of the anvils suggests this is, they were not doing small rings, they were doing something big. And the question is, what is big? It can only be silver diadems, probably, or the sheet, or at least doing silver sheet. But the silver is not local. The silver, according to lead isotope data, comes from 200 meters away in Jaén, in the Sierra Morena, which was controlled at that moment by El Argar. They conquered these mines. And the silver was coming from there and it was transformed in Tira del Lienzo, among other sites, to produce some silver sheets. So, I mean, look at the dimension of this economy. You're storing your grain in high hilltops, you're bringing silver, you're transforming. And this is what in Germany we have this word, Verwertungsprozess. You're shifting surplus from one area to the other and the general population says, what is this banks doing? Anybody of us knows what the banks are doing with all our money? No, and we are supposed to know because we are at the university and we don't know. So imagine these people with the dimension of the territory and the dimension of resources which are being shoveled around and transformed. Sire in the 19th century did this wonderful drawing uh, of a person, how she would have looked like the princess wearing these diadems. He found four diadems in El Argan. In the name giving uh, settlement, he found four diadems in El Agar. Okay, let's then uh, we opened a new uh, window into the past that is located about 35 kilometers inland from Tira del Lienzo. It's called La Almoloya, La Bastida. You see the arrow on the top is behind that mountain, which is 1,400 meters high. And you can see how this plateau, this high plateau is located. Um, it's about uh, 0.4 hectares large. And you can see the architecture. It's very strict, very organized. In the late phase, what you're seeing was constructed around 1,700 the late phase, the maximum expansion, the maximum economic dynamics. This is the site of La Almoloya. And if we look from top, you can, you can hear a 3D model. And here we can see the different, it's, it's like different units. And each of these units is 300 to 400 square meters. So it's no small houses, it's complexes. And if you would find that in Crete, nobody would say, oh, that's a palatial site. Nobody would have a doubt. Or if you find this in Israel, this would be clearly called a palace. But as we are in Western Europe, we have problems of calling this a palatial site. But archaeology sometimes is, is grateful and, and, and the materiality. And in this building, as you can see, it's, uh, there's one large room with benches all around along the, the, the four sides of the room. The room is about 80 square meters, but it has another accessory room. So it would be about 100 square meters in total. And the, you can see here a photograph uh, of, the, of the benches and you can see uh, in the upper middle side, like, a, like an altar or a, uh, yeah, a special construction. And this is going to be important. We placed somebody there, a powerful person. Uh, we checked with students and so we said you can fit 53 persons in there. In the, so it's a meeting place. It's a place, there's no fireplace, there's no kitchenware, there's no, no fauna, there's no uh, botany, seats. It's not a storage area, it's not a workshop, there are no anvils, nothing like that. It was empty. So it's clearly a communicative, we call it the parliament, because people are either listening or talking or debating. And somebody maybe was sitting on that place. And that there was somebody on top of the others was confirmed by burial number 38, which was published a year ago in antiquity. This is the closing 
slab of the burial. Here, this is how it looked in the beginning. Then slowly excavating with the Hoover. We always excavate with Hoover, not with iron uh, tools, especially in the beginning. So it's always clean. You don't brush, you know, no brushing. So it's always clean. And here you see it's a double burial, typical Elargar double burial, a male buried in the first place and a female. And the female is looking at you and you can already see what she's wearing on her head. If we go closer to, it, to them, golden earrings, silver earrings. He's wearing the golden earrings and she was wearing the silver earrings. The, in total, this is most of the finds, not all, but most. It's 230 grams of silver. Um, 230 grams of silver at, in the 17th century, thanks to Hammurabi, we know its value. And 230 grams of value are it's a wage of two years of a, of, a, of a simple worker. So you could contract somebody for two years just with that silver in that burial. So it's a huge value. I mean, it, it, imagine the contract of an assistant in the university for two years. So that's, that's the value which is carried in this, in this burial. And, but look at the type of objects, how strange. One thing which is interesting is that the spirals, the silver spirals are two grams, four grams, eight grams, 16 grams, 32 grams. And they were probably all worn by her hair. So it's a measuring system. So eight grams, what is eight grams? Eight grams in Mesopotamia is one shekel. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's coincidence. Um, uh, the knife is with silver rivets. Where do we have knives with silver rivets? In the Aegean. Nowhere else in Europe do we have knives with silver rivets, only there. And in the Aegean and of course in Anatolia or, or Egypt, she was so delicate and so noble, she couldn't touch wood, a wooden bowl. The all was dressed with the silver foil. Extremely complicated. We have the wood and um, the, the, the X-ray showed us that it is a three metal piece, it's three metal fixed together. So it's a, a, a silversmith of a level, a silversmithing of a level which you only have in Greece at that time. Uh, her lips were so noble she couldn't touch vulgar pottery. She had to have a silver foil between the pot and her lips and her fingers. Unique, really. We, we, we never knew that this existed in El Arga. Only because, you see, and we always say, oh, but we don't know in archaeology. One find shows us that all our images of, of, of what we thought are primitive. Normally, archaeology always shows that our views on the past are primitive substitutes of the past. And this is why we need to do archaeology. Here we have, you have these golden rings, which is a technology which is called anti-clastic uh, gold working. Anti-clastic, because you see it's concave and convex at the same time. Only Mycenaeans were able to do this. This doesn't exist in the rest of Europe. And one amber bead, and the amber was analyzed in Padua, and, and we were told it is Baltic amber. It's Baltic amber, it comes from the Baltic. At the same time, I, I speak about this later, um, and of course the silver diamond, the fifth silver diadem found in an Elargar burial, and all are women, and now we are trying to see, we got in the in Brussels, there's still one of the cranium with the diadem exhibited in the Archaeological Museum of Brussels, and we just took DNA out of the Pars Petrosa, and we are studying this, and if the DNA is preserved, we might figure out if there's some kinship, some biological relationship between these women, because they are all 17th century, they all belong to the 17th century. These are the other burials, the four uh, excavated in the 19th century, and now the one in La Almoloya. This is how they look. They might have looked like, uh, according to... And then, looking at the diaries, which in front of us, Hermann Ulreich already studied in, in, the, in the 80s, 
We figured out more or less where these burials are because we found in the National Museum a map of some burials done by Sire, which you didn't you didn't have at your time. It was it was hidden away from 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 the archaeologists, and that shows that the four burials, the four women with diadems, all occupy this part. This was done by Rafael Miko. He showed that here probably they are only one part. So this shows that there is a quarter where the aristocracy is living. Um, this is where these burials are. And as I say, we are trying to maybe get some, 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 um, some DNA. All this, let's, let's quickly look at, at, at uh, what happens. I think I still, do I have five minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's sh shortly look of what we are finding in, in, in Aunyatis. Now, uh, what do we see? We see the carinated bowl, no decoration, standardized product over 600 years, unifying a territory, identifying together with other objects like the pin, um, the eyelet pin, and Again, you have something which is emerging out of a combination of two people, the corded ware and the bell beaker, according to the genetic data. Oops, sorry. Ah, shit. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to air photographies and um, again, documents of the 19th century, we know there was a huge burial mound, much larger than Neubingen and Helmsdorf in Bornhoek. It was the limit between Saxony and Prussia, but it was uh, dismantled in the 19th century because the soil of the tumulus was so fertile that the peasants needed that soil to fertilize their, 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 their fields. And it's very close to Disca. And the Prince of Diskau, the Count of Diskau, allowed this dismantling. And he actually bought the treasure of Diskau, these golden objects. And maybe these golden, the, the uh, golden objects of Diskau, these golden weapons and, and, and ornaments are coming from this burial. But of course, the peasants would have never said this because then they would have got no money for the gold finds. While when they said that they found it doing agriculture, they got a good price from the count. That might be an explanation, but it's 500 meters from here. It's a, it was a 60 meter diameter hill uh, at, in the Bronze Age, at least 15 meters high. In Prussian times, it was over 20 meters high, but probably in, in later in Iron Age, it was built above. It was all this metal, but the lowest layer. The central burial was, of course, destroyed. They even took out the planks but the, uh, as you can see in the upper left photo, they even, you could even see the imprints of the planks, which show that it was exactly the same type of wooden chamber as Leubingen and Helmsdorf. Um, so totally dismantled, but the stone cairn around the uh, central burial of this eminent burial could be excavated. Part of it in the laboratory here you see Selina Delgado, and it was packed with specific ground uh, grinding stone uh, ground stone tools, macrolithic tools, dozens of hammer stones used to sharpen grinding stones. But you see the dimensions, dozens of hammers. But most of all, what we found is grinding stones. All the red uh, dots or ovals are grinding stones, still kept there. This is not all, just what was left by the peasants of the 19th century, which they didn't take. We have documents of local archeologists in the end of the 19th century saying that the peasants had in their garden grinding stones uh, used as fish pots. Uh, and the ones which are still there um, are, most of them are new. They are not very used. Some are more used like here, but look at the thickness. These grinding stones, they could have been used another, for another 50 years before breaking. 
huge gland. But the dimension, these glandular cells are half a meter long. This is much larger than what we knew from what, man, what I just showed from El Argar. Here, another one, which must have been sunk in somewhere. And these must come from some settlement. We don't know where, but somewhere they must have been. In total, we calculate that the whole stone kern, based on what we have found, probably had 500 grinding stones. 500 grinding stones daily used for one or two hours is sufficient to feed 2,500 to 5,000 persons. Who is interested in feeding 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 persons? This is not going to be some uh, craftsman or craftswoman. This is not going to be some aristocratic elite. This can only be an army. And if you know Harald Meller's work on the on the um, on the deposits on the X de deposits hoards on the X hoards and Halbert hoards, he found out that there is a metrical dimension of the number of axes, and that the number of axes could reflect military units. That the hoards are not gifts to the gods. That the hoards are political statements of military units under officer's command because the halberds would signal the officers of the warriors with access. All this he published in antiquity, I think two or three years ago. So the grinding stones again fit very well with the thing, but it shows us the, the dimension of the, of the working. And here you see the yellow uh, ring is the grinding stones of Aunyatids found in houses or pits, and the blue ones are the ones from the Bornhoek. As they are so large, the only thing we can imagine is that there are two persons working at the same time, because the hand stones, the upper part, they weighed 12 to 13 kilos. In Africa, I haven't seen any woman using anything heavier than eight kilos, and already eight kilos was like the top. They were extremely resistant and strong women. So 12 kilos, either it was male slaves or it was two persons grinding masses of cereal down. So we have it in El Arga, we have it in Aunyatids. Um, when we look at Aunyatids, this is what we're doing now, where are they found? So far, the cases we have, you have is typical in red, the, the red Aunyatids longhouse. And in the longhouses and the pits around them, you don't find these large grinding stones. You find them away, like outside. Maybe there were some huts or some other installations, but it's not in the longhouses. Here, Kleinpaschle, a, lang, a longhouse, the huge grinding stone they found was found 100 meters away with no house in the neighborhood, no archeologically definable house. There were of course houses, but something else. So maybe we have slaves, slave labor, working in the surroundings of these settlements. And maybe in Fuente Alamo on the Südhang, we must imagine some slave labor working. You can say slaves, servants, I don't want to pick on the word, but somehow extremely exploited uh, workforce. And um, so if we go back to El Argar, this all looks very similar. And I don't know, I, I think if we would do more of these studies of the macrolithic tools, also in the Aegean where we know nothing, I think we would find that the second millennium, the late third and the second millennium probably is the beginning of tax pay. And that people started to produce cereal to pay taxes to a central institution. And that this central institution used this cereal to accelerate a secondary economy, and that this economy had an exponential dynamic development until they all collapse. This is, the, this is why the title of the conference is disruptive. It's not only disruptive because it implies a huge exploitation of, 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 of society, of large parts of society. Aunitids and Elarga collapse exactly 2550 
shortly after the Nebraskaitis is hidden. Um, Ottomani, others also collapse. So it's a huge exponential and it suddenly collapses. There could, of course, be climatic reasons, etc. But it's in Wessex collapses, Britannia, the, the princely grace of Britannia disappear. All the map I showed you, all these antiquities by 1500, they are gone. And we have a totally different social situation in Europe for the next thousand years. We do not see cities, we do not see until the Iron Age. In, in Iberia, until the Phoenicians, we have no evidence of social pyramids. We have no princely grave. We have no signs of accumulation of surplus in Iberia for the next 600, 700 years until Tartessos uh, starts in the Guadalquivir, southwest. And the rest in Catalonia, we don't have evidence for cities and states until the Romans arrive, you know. Um, so, um, just to finish, could this be a connected world? Well, this map was done by the London Stenkmal Amt Sachsen, especially under supervision of Harald Miller and, and, um, and Heinrich Bunefeld. And this is the amber finds around 1700 in the early Bronze Age. And as you see, Central Europe emerged as a central controlling place, Baltic amber. But exactly at thousand at this time, 1700, uh, the other day also talking with, with Maran, with Professor Maran from Heidelberg, he also said it's a short period where they seemed, everybody seemed to be connected. And the amber may be showing this. You have Baltic amber in Mycenae on Crete, and we have two amber pieces which are clearly Baltic amber, and they are dated to this period, late Elargar period. So maybe these elites work we're connected and they have something how the political and economic structure of these states of these european first european states have something in common um well thank you very much and of course we should never uh, forget all the people who participate in this and all the people who are invited to visit these sites that's the main important thing why we do archaeology